Hello grade 10s. Today we will look at the model of a metallic bond. We have learned that metals are found on the left hand side of the periodic table and in the transition metal block. A metal element is a pure substance made up of atoms all having the same number of protons. In any random sample of a metal there are billions of atoms grouped together. The negative valence electrons in the outer shell of each metal atom are not held strongly enough to remain orbiting their own nucleus. This is due to the complete electron shells between the nucleus and the outer energy shell. They shield the attractive force so the outer electrons become delocalized and move freely throughout the whole structure. When the outer valence electrons drift away, the nucleus and inner electrons form a positive region of charge. The electrostatic forces between the drifting valence electrons and positively charged nuclei allows for a flexible metal lattice to form. These forces are non-directional. Let's join Nelly and look at the bonds in copper metal. Copper is a pure substance made up of atoms all having the same number of protons. In this sample, there are billions of billions of copper atoms grouped together. The fact that copper is a solid at room temperature tells us that there must be fairly strong forces holding the copper atoms together. However, we also know that copper bends and conducts electricity. These properties tell us that the forces holding the atoms together are not too strong and so allow them some movement. To see where these forces come from, let's get some information about the size of the copper atom. The nucleus of the most common copper atom contains 29 protons and 34 neutrons. There are 29 electrons found in four energy levels around the nucleus. The distance from the center of the nucleus to the outermost electron is called the atomic radius of an atom. The atomic radius of a copper atom is 135 picometers. Although that sounds very small, it is just over two times bigger than the atomic radius of oxygen. In fact, it seems that all metal atoms have very large atomic radii compared to non-metal atoms. Now let's use this important data and focus on just one copper atom. Because of the size of the atom, the electrons in the outer energy level of this copper atom are very far away from the positively charged nucleus. So although the negative electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus, the force of attraction is quite weak. We say these outer electrons, called valence electrons, are loosely held and can drift away from this metal atom. Now when the valence electrons drift away, the nucleus and inner electrons form a positive region of charge. This region can attract drifting electrons from neighboring atoms. The overall or net effect of all the electrostatic forces between the drifting valence electrons and the positively charged nuclei of the different atoms is to keep all the copper atoms together in a flexible lattice. Although we have used copper as our example, the same principles are true for all metals and so the model we have used to show the bonds in copper can be used to represent the bonds in all metals. This metallic bond model we have just seen is extremely useful as it helps us understand how metal atoms, although neutral, can stick together. Like any model in science, the metallic bond is not the real thing, but it helps us represent something we cannot actually see. And like other models, it helps us to make predictions and explain the properties of the real thing it represents. Can you remember how the metallic bond model can be used to explain why metals are good electrical conductors? Well, remember that electric current is really the movement of charged particles through a substance. In metals, there are billions of electrons moving about in a random way. So it's not surprising that when a source of electric energy is connected to the ends of a metal, you can force all the particles with the same charge to move together in one direction. 
Thank you, Nelly. It is clear that the model for metallic bonding is completely different to the models for covalent and ionic bonding. The metallic bond is the electrostatic attraction between the positively charged nuclei of metallic atoms and the delocalized electrons in the metal. Whereas a covalent bond forms when electrons between two non-metal atoms are shared. One shared pair is a single bond. Two shared pairs is called a double bond. And three shared pairs is called a triple bond. These form small molecules with a fixed number of atoms in the molecule. Ionic bonding is the transfer of electrons between metal and non-metal atoms. The metal atom donates electrons and forms a positive ion called a cation. A non-metal atom accepts electrons and forms a negative ion called an anion. These cations and anions combine in a crystal lattice. There are strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the alternating positive and negative ions in the crystal lattice. The crystal lattice does have a fixed number of atoms, but the proportion of metal to non-metal atoms remains the same. Both covalent and ionic bonds are stronger than metallic bonds, but as we have seen, metallic bonds have their own unique properties which make metals invaluable in everyday life. This brings us to the end on our lesson on metallic bonding grade 10s. You'll also find more information about metallic bonding at www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Remember to try some of the questions in the task video too. Take care and goodbye.